Personally, I've always found affirmative action to be a really difficult subject to tackle. As someone who's argued multiple times on this channel that systemic racism has a meaningful impact on American society, I'm always looking out for policies that can mitigate the effects of that discrimination. At the same time though, affirmative action brings up charges of reverse discrimination that make it hard to reconcile with the goal of eliminating discrimination. What makes things even worse is that so much of the discourse around affirmative action is dominated by reactionary politics. The only institutional on the books policies that discriminate in practice in, in written code against white people are those affirmative action policies. And you ask if those hurt people, you ask if that makes a difference, of course it does. You know, that you tell somebody who's white, they don't get to go to college because of the color of their skin. They don't get Oof. a job because of the color of their skin. Too bad in places where that was challenged, like at the University of Texas, they still took the top 10% of applicants and the Supreme Court struck that down as not necessarily being a racist policy. So today, I want to have a more honest and informed conversation about affirmative action and clearly dive into the merits and pitfalls of the policy. Hey YouTube, welcome to Unboxing Politics. Today we're unboxing... Affirmative Action. For starters, what exactly is affirmative action? For a thorough definition, you can consult Black's Law Dictionary. But the basic gist is this. Affirmative action seeks to eliminate the effects of past discrimination, existing discrimination, and likelihood of future discrimination in certain educational or occupational settings. And it often achieves this goal by providing admissions or employment preferences to members of groups that have been historically discriminated against. Before I get to actually exploring the merits of affirmative action, I do have a few caveats for the video. First, this video isn't about the legality of affirmative action. Second, this video is mostly focused on college admissions, even though affirmative action is applicable in other contexts. And third, I'll mostly be focusing on race-based affirmative action, even though the policy can apply to gender, veteran status, or individuals with disabilities. So with that context in mind, let's get to dissecting four questions that'll indicate the benefits and costs of affirmative action. The mismatch theory argues that affirmative action ends up backfiring on the minority students it's intended to help. YouTube political commentator Destiny explains why this might be the case. Affirmative action tends to run into trouble in universities where huge mismatch problems occur. Minority students who are given too much preferential treatment and admissions will massively underperform their peers, causing them to drop out at disproportionately high rates. So how do researchers actually go about testing for the effects of mismatch? To determine whether mismatch occurs in admissions, researchers compare URM students who attend a top school to other URM students who receive admission to the same top school, but choose to attend a less prestigious school for various reasons. If the latter student has greater academic achievement than the former student, this would indicate that mismatch or affirmative action is misplacing URM students into exceedingly difficult academic environments. There are many different studies that have explored the question of mismatch using this study design, but some of them can come to conflicting conclusions. So for the sake of keeping this video a little bit shorter than normal, I'm going to only explore two of what I think are the strongest studies finding evidence for the mismatch effect. A 2013 study compared the outcomes of black students who attended tier 1 and 2 law schools to outcomes of students attending tier 5 and 6 law schools. For context, tier 1 and 2 schools were assumed to be the most selective law schools, while tier 5 and 6 were assumed to be the least selective law schools. The study ultimately found that attending a high-tier law school actually reduced the likelihood of a black student passing the bar exam on their first try and their likelihood of ever passing the bar exam. These results sound pretty troubling. 
But we can't jump the gun, because there are a few problems with this study. First, most of the results omit any mention of Tier 3 and 4 law schools, which are home to around 50% of Black law school graduates. And in the singular table that does address all six law school tiers, the author arbitrarily draws a distinction between Tier 2 and 3 law schools, even though the academic credentials of students attending these schools are roughly equal. But even if we put this issue completely aside, the study seems to gloss over the fact that Tier 6 law schools are actually composed of HBCUs. On one hand, comparing the outcomes of HBCUs to Tier 1 and 2 law schools is useful because HBCUs, by definition, don't use affirmative action to admit Black students. On the other hand, the success of Black law school students at HBCUs could be driven by other factors, like a more supportive environment or lower bar exam cutoff scores in states where HBCUs are located. So the 2013 study does not provide definitive evidence of mismatch in law school admissions. But what about a 2016 study which found evidence of mismatch for students majoring in STEM fields. This study examined affirmative action while it was still legal in California, and concluded that less prepared URM students majoring in STEM would have had higher graduation rates if they had attended a school like UC Riverside instead of a more challenging school like UC Berkeley. Honestly, I can't find that much to criticize about this study. I could argue that a STEM degree from UC Berkeley is more valuable than a degree from UC Riverside, but the researchers show that the reverse is actually true for less academically prepared students. I could also try to argue that eliminating affirmative action would cause a cascade effect that displaces URM students from admission to any UC school. But the study points out that diversity at elite schools usually comes at the expense of diversity at middle tier schools, so abolishing affirmative action would simply reverse this dynamic. The only scholarly criticism of the study I could find originates from economist Zachary Bleemer, who authored a study demonstrating that affirmative action bans in the UC school system actually decreased STEM persistence among URM students. But because the study hasn't been fully peer-reviewed and its datasets aren't publicly available for replication, it's hard to take Bleemer's study at face value. So to wrap up the mismatch issue, it seems like there's not evidence of mismatch in admissions for humanities or social science majors, but there is evidence that suggests that affirmative action is potentially harmful for students who are majoring in STEM fields. Typically, universities defend affirmative action on the grounds that greater racial diversity on college campuses leads to cognitive benefits for their student body. For example, a meta-analysis of 17 studies found that racial diversity has a positive relationship with better cognitive abilities. Additionally, an experimental study of group discussions and post-discussion essays found that dissenting opinions were more likely to be perceived as novel when they were voiced by participants from racial minorities groups. So do these cognitive benefits justify the use of affirmative action? I would argue no, not because I don't think racial diversity is valuable, but because I don't think colleges and universities would ever apply this argument consistently to other forms of diversity, like political diversity. For example, a 2017 study found that greater political diversity among Wikipedia authors led them to produce higher quality content on their website, and the same experimental study I cited earlier found that the presence of a dissenting opinion in a group discussion increased the complexity of group members' post-discussion essays. So to me, if the benefits of racial diversity justify the use of affirmative action, then the benefits of political diversity should also justify admissions preferences for conservatives and libertarians who are underrepresented political minorities on college campuses. You're committing a false equivalence fallacy here. Racial diversity matters because it counters pernicious stereotypes that developed around minority groups as a result of centuries of oppression and segregation. The same cannot be said for political diversity. And no, cancel culture does not count as oppression.
I totally agree that this distinction is true, but notice that the racial diversity has benefits argument is no longer doing the heavy lifting, and the debate is now focused around whether black people or other racial minority groups are owed affirmative action in response to centuries of oppression and segregation. Interestingly, a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found that black families are more likely to favor this morally based justification for affirmative action over the racial diversity has benefits argument. If the justification for affirmative action is now centered on remedying a history of discrimination and segregation, then does affirmative action actually benefit the people harmed by such discrimination? In 2016, Vox tried to address this question with a piece titled, White Women Benefit the Most from Affirmative Action and Are Among Its Fiercest Opponents. Destiny has also echoed the sentiments of the Vox piece in a more recent 2020 debate. Wait, wait, here's like a super big go, tip, okay? Go. Minorities black. in the United States fucking hate affirmative action because affirmative action has generally gone to benefit middle class white women. There's like your yep. huge fucking yep. black belt if you want, okay? So to support its claims, the Vox article cites a number of statistics. In 1995, white women in California held more managerial jobs than members of any minority group. Since the 1970s, the percentage of female physicians has tripled. And since 2009, women have constituted the majority of bachelor's degree recipients. As interesting as these stats are though, it kind of feels like Vox and Destiny by Proxy cobbled together a bunch of random facts to make an edgy but uninformed case about how affirmative action is supposedly undermining its stated goals. Like first, most of these statistics cited by Vox don't actually compare the impact of affirmative action on white women relative to women of color, and the stats that do compare outcomes between racial groups are correlational rather than causal. Lastly, there's strong evidence that just flat out contradicts the affirmative action only benefits white women narrative. For example, a 2015 longitudinal study found that the greatest beneficiaries of affirmative action in the workplace were Black and Native American people. So I think it's difficult to argue that racial minority groups secretly hate affirmative action because it mostly benefits white women. But let's take a look at the actual members of racial minority groups that benefit from affirmative action. Typically, they're from a privileged immigrant background, meaning they aren't even descended from black people who bore the brunt of racist government policies. Isn't this contrary to the stated goals of affirmative action? Well, maybe? A 2006 study found that 41% of black freshmen entering Ivy League schools came from an immigrant background. Notably, the vast majority of these black immigrant students were from Nigeria or Ghana, which reflects the fact that these countries have stable political institutions. In contrast, Somali or Sudanese immigrants are barely represented at all in elite universities, which is probably driven by the fact that most are refugees rather than voluntary migrants. So it's important to recognize that there's also a lot of diversity within the African immigrant population. With that being said though, it's also true that the primary intention behind affirmative action was to redress the effects of racist government policy, which prevented generations of African Americans from securing economic opportunities. So the fact that affirmative action disproportionately benefits African immigrants rather than US descended black people reveals that either the intention or implementation of a affirmative action might need to change. One of the most prominent criticisms of affirmative action is that it relies on unjust anti-Asian discrimination. Supporting this claim is a book authored by Thomas Espenshade and Alexandria Radford, which found that relative to white applicants, Asian American applicants to elite universities experience a 140 point SAT score penalty, while black applicants receive a 310 point bonus. But differences in the SAT scores of admitted students could simply reflect pre-existing differences in SAT score distributions by race, rather than unfair racial bonuses and penalties. This is a potentially valid counter-argument, but it's complicated. To see why, imagine that we have two populations, group X and group Y, where X has a lower SAT score distribution than Y. Suppose students from these groups are applying to an elite university with some SAT score cutoff. If we compare the average score of an admitted student from group X with the average score of an admitted student from group Y, 
it's entirely possible that a significant difference would emerge between the two groups, even though the school used the same standard for both. So whether or not a racial difference in SAT scores is justified now depends on the mathematical variables involved, the means of these distributions, and the placement of the cutoff. Even if the differences in distributions didn't explain the SAT score difference, Espenshade and Radford themselves have said that their results are not smoking gun proof of anti-Asian discrimination. That's because their study doesn't take essays or teacher recommendations into account. The issue I have with appealing to unobserved variables like essay quality or teacher recommendations is that they could be biased against Asian Americans. In the recent Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard court case, Harvard was forced to open up a treasure trove of data about their application process to researchers who were interested in determining whether Harvard discriminates against Asian Americans. Using this data set, Duke economist Peter Archidiacono found that Asian Americans receive higher than average academic academic scores, but their personal ratings, which are determined by essays, recommendations, and interviews, are significantly lower compared to other racial groups. And accounting for this discrepancy in personal ratings reduces the Asian American penalty in Harvard admissions by almost 50%. Hey guys, quick correction to the study I just cited. While it's true that the study does find evidence of anti-Asian bias in Harvard's admissions process, UC Berkeley economist David Card came to the exact opposite conclusion in a separate study. There are literally more than a hundred pages worth of material on this, so to keep things quick, here's a list of issues that Card has with the Arch Diacono study. First, Arch Diacono wrongfully excludes athletes and legacy students from his analysis. Second, using Archidiacono's own model, there's an unexplained bonus for Asian Americans' academic scores. So you can't claim an anti-Asian bias in the personal rating without also acknowledging a pro-Asian bias in the academic score. Third, Archidiacono's analysis of the personal rating fails to take personal essays into consideration. And fourth, academic excellence is literally the most common quality among Harvard's applicant pool, so it's no surprise that non-academic qualities are going to have the most power in determining who gets into Harvard and who doesn't. Personally, I find critiques 2 and 3 to be compelling, while critiques 1 and 4 seem kinda sus. But regardless of what I think, please try to keep these critiques in mind as you watch the rest of the video. Thanks! The issue is that we need to differentiate between negative action and affirmative action. As explained by scholar William Kidder, negative action involves an anti-Asian bias that privileges white applicants over Asian Americans. On the other hand, affirmative action involves increased consideration of Black, Hispanic, and Native American applicants. If we get rid of negative action while preserving affirmative action, then Asian American admissions to elite schools will certainly increase without harming other applicants of color. Despite the fact that the graph displayed in Kidder's research is about as bad as a graph from PragerU, There is some other interesting data to back this assertion up. A recent working paper published by Archie Diacono found that Harvard extends extraordinary admissions preferences for athletes, legacy students, dean's list students, and children of faculty and staff also referred to as ALDC students. Additionally, a 2011 study found that access to private college counseling is the strongest predictor of a student enrolling into a school through early admissions. What's more is that both the population of students benefiting from ALDC preferences and the population of students benefiting from early admissions are disproportionately wealthy and white. For that reason, I'd argue that negative action against Asian Americans primarily operates through unfair preferences for higher income white students. But two things can be true simultaneously. Racial preferences for minority students are unfair, and so are legacy and early decision preferences for wealthier white applicants. I think this is the most difficult criticism of affirmative action to grapple with, and it's what'll lead me to the policy conclusion of this video. So given that we've explored many of the arguments for and against affirmative action, what should universities do going forward to improve their admissions processes? Personally, I'm in favor of a wealth-based affirmative action system for three main reasons. 
The first reason is that it can account for the fact that Black families have faced intergenerational barriers to wealth accumulation as a direct result of government policy. Currently, age-adjusted statistics indicate that the median net worth of a white person is around four to six times higher than the median net worth of a Black person. So, a wealth-based affirmative action system would account for the effects of historical discrimination in a similar fashion to race-based affirmative action. The second reason I prefer a wealth-based system is that it can also account for the experiences of lower-income white and Asian applicants who may not have fallen victim to the same racist government policies that Black families have, but still experience disadvantages in their life as a result of their lower socioeconomic status. And lastly, a wealth-based affirmative action system can counter the unfair preferences that are granted to wealthier ALDC applicants in the process. But wealth isn't the only way that systemic racism harms the lives of Black Americans. Police brutality and environmental toxins have unique harms against Black people too. So why should we strip race from the equation entirely? I think that affirmative action is just a crudely designed tool to address the racialized harms of issues like police brutality or environmental toxins. I think better solutions, for example, would involve improved policing practices or greater investments of infrastructure that can really directly tackle the root of these problems. In a previous video, you argued against a wealth tax on the grounds that valuing the assets that someone has is a difficult and costly task. So shouldn't you oppose wealth-based affirmative action on the same grounds? Not necessarily, and the reason is because of the level of precision involved for each policy. A wealth tax requires significant levels of precision because the tax only kicks in at really high levels of wealth. That high cutoff gives rich people the leeway to make use of tax loopholes to undervalue their wealth below this threshold. But for a wealth-based affirmative action system, there's not that much precision that's necessary. At the end of the day, whether you're Jeff Bezos using your billions to fly into outer space, or a Twitch streamer just buying a million dollar mansion, so few Americans have anywhere near this amount of wealth. Also, people file for taxes on a yearly basis, but typically only apply to college maybe once, twice, or even three times in their lifetime. So that makes it much more feasible for people to make use of a wealth-based affirmative action system rather than a wealth tax system. So now that you know I support a wealth-based affirmative action system, there's not really that much left to be said on this topic. I guess some last food for thought would be that a solid majority of colleges don't even consider race at all in their admissions process, so every argument in this video is pretty much limited to the most selective tier of colleges and universities which do use racial preferences in admissions. That's it for this video. If you have any disagreements or questions about the studies cited or the arguments presented, feel free to leave them in the comments section below. Thanks for watching.